And we turn now back to the United States, where an estimated 1.1 million people are living with HIV. And it's gay black men who are most at risk right now. Stephen W. Thrasher is the Daniel Renberg Chair of Social Justice Journalism at Northwestern University. He says that while new HIV infection rates are dropping in cities around the U.S., the virus is actually on the rise in rural America. And he tells our Hari Srinivasan why the United States is not prepared to deal with this crisis. So, Stephen, it says that there are 1.1 million people in the U.S. living with HIV today. And you had a recent article in The Times. How is it that cities like New York, San Francisco, Chicago, the HIV rates are declining, but in rural areas, they're climbing, and you're saying it's going to get worse? It probably is going to get worse in rural areas. Cities have been very proactive about addressing the crisis and trying to do things about it that are effective. And this has happened at all kinds of levels. So at one level, they just have better public infrastructure in the first place in terms of dealing with health. And even though cities are places where HIV rates have been very dense, mm -hmm. um, they've had decades of working on uh, ways to address it and then very directly trying to address the populations that are at risk. Uh, the biggest population at risk are young men who have sex with men, particularly of color. And so cities are very aggressively trying to create interventions around those people, mm -hmm. uh, getting drugs to them. The drugs that we can get to people once they have become HIV positive not only help their health, but it prevents onward transmission to other people. So getting those drugs to them. Also getting them preventive medication. Uh, Truvada uh, is the brand name for this drug prep that people can take as a preventive measure. Yeah. And then also just having ways to get people tested in the first place. And cities, uh, particularly New York, they're very uh, aggressive about trying to get people tested at all kinds of levels. And that, uh, that just simply doesn't exist in rural parts of the country. That infrastructure doesn't exist. The culture of getting people tested. Uh, you know, I've talked to sources in West Virginia and rural America where they'll say that they know doctors who've never done an HIV test in their career. Wow. And cities are just much more aggressive about doing those things. And also, they've been really good about uh, addressing the specific health challenges of these populations, having queer specific sex education, having trans-specific sex education. And then the epidemic that's really taking the country right now, they're also going after the uh, drug crisis and having safe needle exchanges. And some cities are even having safe injection sites. And very little of that exists in rural America. So really, the opioid crisis is having an impact on HIV rates. Very much so around the country. Uh, I try to think, as, a, as an AIDS historian, an AIDS scholar, I try to think about how the story of AIDS is a story of deindustrialization. Latoya F Ruby Frazier talks about how industrialization uses workers' bodies up. And when their bodies have been used up, what has been left behind? And so when you look at places where, uh, where the mill is closed or, or coal mines have closed, people's bodies have been had a huge toll taken on them. They've had lots of injuries. They've had lots of pain. And as that's happening, Purdue Pharma is sending in all of these mm. drugs. You can see towns where 100 pills per person have been sent into these towns. And this is happening as people are losing their jobs and they're losing their health insurance. And when they lose their health insurance and their bodies are in pain and they can't get that prescription high anymore, they often turn to injection drug use. And so this happened kind of most saliently. We saw this happen in Scott County, Indiana in 2014 and 2015 uh, in Southern Indiana. Mike Pence, the now vice president, was the governor at the time. And infamously, his health people came to him when they started to see that there was a crisis happening and said, we need to do some kind of needle program. And he infamously, infamously said that he needed to pray about it and mm -hmm. took some time to pray about it before he had an answer. And two of my colleagues at the Yale School of Public Health, uh, Forrest Crawford and Greg Gonzalez, did research looking at that years before they had really cut all the surveillance mechanisms for even looking at HIV in the first place. And so at that time, the Centers for Disease Control outlined that there were 220 such counties throughout the United States that were like Scott County. They were sort of sitting ducks waiting for the, a potential hepatitis or HIV outbreak to occur because they didn't have prevention measures, they didn't have uh, proper uh, harm reduction programs. They didn't have education around these things. And so they're just sort of waiting for an outbreak that could occur in those places because there, there's not really counting happen, happening until you know that there's something bad is going on. And that's what's now happening in West Virginia. So you're saying essentially that the 
culture clash and the conservatism ends up fueling policies that actually endanger communities. Yes, that's very much true. And it happens at various levels. So at the emergency level, the thing that needs to happen quickly when we understand something like this happens is getting clean needles into people's hands, uh, particularly because uh, inject injection drug use is one of the fastest ways that HIV and also hepatitis can move between people. And there's a lot of conservative misinformation about what these programs do. They'll say that they make people more likely to use drugs. They'll say that it makes uh, unclean needles more likely to be left out in public and that it's going to bring crime. And we actually know all of these things are not true. Research has been pretty consistent for decades that these kinds of harm mechanisms get people into care, uh, make them less likely to have needles out in the open, and they don't increase crime or anything like that. So that's sort of at the emergency level. And then at the bigger cultural level, there are these things that are really putting people at harm. Uh, one is that many of these states, and I see this in my own research in Missouri, where I've been studying the criminalization of HIV for about five, six years now, uh, I've seen this in, in Missouri as well, is that when you have states and localities that have abstinence-only education, uh, STA, STI rates are going to go up, HIV rates are going to go up. And so there are huge parts of the country, particularly where these 220 counties are, that have either abstinence-only education or they have uh, pregnancy-only education, and we're not teaching the young people what they need to know to be able to protect their bodies as they become sexual beings. There seems to be kind of a, a, a geographic cross-section here. I mean, on the one hand, Georgia has the highest rates of new HIV infections in the country. I mean, the South is only responsible for a little more than a third of the population, but uh, more than half of the new HIV diagnoses are happening in the South. Why? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting and sad story. Uh, so cities have some infrastructure, and these rural parts of the country really don't. And the South uh, has had some of the worst rates of HIV that have to be read in the context of a bigger health crisis in the country, which is access to medication, access to health care. So in the South, we have some of the lowest rates of access to medication at all, or health care at all. You have the cases not just going, not just be, being a matter of HIV exposure. If someone is exposed to HIV and we find out about it and they had an HIV test at their annual physical and we got them a medication, they would go on and live the rest of their life normally. Uh, it's actually easier to deal with than diabetes or any other number of chronic conditions. But when somebody doesn't get access to the medication, it can progress onto AIDS. And during that time, there also trans the transmission can happen through them because we're not able to suppress the viral load. So the South is a real, uh, is a real vector of places where people don't have access to the medication, they don't have access to regular health insurance, and so the rates are going up and up. And there's such stigma and shame that even people who probably know what's going on, the symptoms have gotten so bad, they're just so frightened to get care that they don't until it, until it gets uh, too bad. And then the virus keeps moving and getting more prevalent within their communities. Well, let's talk a little bit about the medication that is available. How is this rolling out around, across the United States? So since 1996, we have had a drug called, they're most often called antiretrovirals or ARVs. Mm -hmm. And these very effectively not only save people's lives, but they make a transmission not happen through sex once people are on them. And 1996 is the banner year that we have to look at because the AIDS rate, the AIDS deaths rates dropped precipitously that year. But they moved out and they got rolled out very uh, unequally racially and geographically, and that's why we're seeing very different stories in cities and in the rural South. Mm -hmm. So for people who got the medication, the virus started to cycle out of the population and the rate went down. And for people who didn't go, uh, didn't get the medication, groups that didn't get it, the viral rate actually got dense around them and went up. And from the CDC's own data, you can look at the rate of AIDS uh, in the population amongst white people and black people in 1995, before there were drugs, and 2015, uh, almost 20 years after there were drugs. The rate for black America in 2015 was actually slightly higher uh, than it was for white people when there were no drugs. Wow. And, so, and that's not because black people have more sex or uh, unprotected sex or use IV drugs more. They actually engage in those activities less. But because black people en masse did not get the drugs, the, vir the rate has actually gone up in black America. So we have these drugs that are available, and they're extraordinarily and unconscionably expensive. The drug is up to $2,000 a month for people to get, 
So at an emergency level, we need to get it into these places where these outbreaks are happening. But also very proactively, we need to get it into young uh, men who have sex with men and people of color who are in communities where the rate is very high. Because if we can just start, if we can just start addressing it, then the rate of HIV will start cycling down in those populations. You know, some of your reporting lays out this racial dimension to this. If I was a straight white man, I have a one in twenty five hundred chance of getting HIV, but one in every two black, gay, and bisexual men in the U.S. are projected to become HIV positive in their lifetimes. That's correct. It's really, uh, it, it's extraordinary. And so who has power in this country and who's affected by this are very different populations. My colleague, Linda Villarosa, who I believe has been on the show, wrote the New York Times cover story about black gay men in the South. And she phrases it very poetically, pointing out that Swaziland, the tiny country in southern Africa, which has about a million people, has the highest rate of HIV on Earth. It's about 28, 29 percent of the population. But black gay men, you know, we're on record to go to 50 percent. If black gay men and men who have sex with men, bisexual men, were a country, we would have the highest rate of HIV on the Earth. And it's not because, as I said before, it's not because we engage in riskier sex or drug use. We don't. But because we didn't get the drugs, the rate is continue to keep going up and up in our in our network. And this has both to do with um, with not having access to the drugs, with also because black people have sex with other black people across age. So mm. someone who's 25, 30 might have a sexual partner who's 50, who's in the group that was around when HIV was much higher. Uh, but unlike the 50-year-old white person and their group that got the drugs, the 50-year-old black person is in, in a group that largely didn't get the drugs, so the risk is more and engagement and activity is more. And it's um, it's really heartbreaking that this is not front page news all the time. I, I can't imagine if one and two white women were going to become HIV positive, that it would be uh, such an uncovered story most of the time. Do we care less about it today because we feel like, well, there's medication out there, it's suppressing it, we don't really have to worry about it, we don't have the same level of, oh my gosh, this person died, this person died, this person died. It is a, it's a hard thing to battle when people think I can just take a pill to manage it. Yeah. Um, you have to be on that pill for the rest of your life, which means not only having health insurance in this country, but also housing and a, a lot of other things with it. And it's also really hard because there has been almost a revanchist idea around sex education in this country, that we, we need broader sex education. And the cities that are doing well not only have sex, sex education that includes uh, sex, yeah. pregnancy, and uh, queer and trans sex, they also are looking at broader things that help. So in Illinois, where, where I now live, uh, Illinois is rolling out next year a comprehensive LGBTQ curriculum uh, statewide for public schools. And that's great because it will help uh, young people feel less bad about their bodies and will help them understand their bodies and there's nothing wrong with them that will decrease stigma and help them be able to make the decisions they need when they're becoming sexual beings and need to protect themselves. Let's talk a little bit about the, the global picture as well. 37.9 uh, million people around the world are living with HIV. About 1.7 million people became newly infected. That's just an ending in 2018. Where are most people or more of the people that are infected with HIV living now? So about two thirds of the people are living in sub-Saharan Africa. And there's variations within that, but a good concentration of people are living in sub-Saharan Africa, some in Central Asia. Uh, the United States are about a million of the, mm -hmm. of the 37, 38 million people globally. Are the new infections also in sub-Saharan Africa because that's where the largest population is? Or are we seeing it in other parts of the world where we weren't uh, seeing it before? We're seeing it all over the world, and it's hard to paint a general, a general picture. Things change from year to year as countries try different approaches. Deaths are down. That's good news. The, yeah. the peak deaths, I think, in 2004 were about a million eight. They're down to about 750,000 now. But new infections are either stagnant or rising in certain places in the world. Well, one of the things that the, the UN AIDS stats reveal is that more young women are getting infected than men. Why does that happen? Well, in the United States, we tend to think of the, the uh, HIV moving through populations of people who use intravenous drugs and men who have sex with men. Those are the primary ways they've happened in this country. But in other parts of the world, uh, the vectors have moved very differently. They've moved through heterosexual sex. They've moved through what's called vertical transmission, where it goes from a parent to a child. 
and birth. And in the same way in the U.S., uh, gay men uh, were often thought to be uh, promiscuous. We actually are often the ones who are protecting ourselves the most. People who are married often, of course, they often don't use birth control or they don't use uh, STI control. So for women, one of the things globally that can be the most dangerous for them is to have a husband, to have someone they're having sex with where they're not having any kind of protection. Mm. And so that's one of the reasons we see things moving internationally in that direction. And there's a similar dynamic happening globally and in the U.S. that, that one of the largest areas where where transmission is happening is people who don't know their status. So I think the UN AIDS said recently that about one in five people living with HIV globally don't know their status. In the US, that differs by the populations you're looking at. I believe that's about normal here. But then when you go young, when you look at young people, maybe half people don't know their status. And wow. um, my colleague Brian Mostansky at Northwestern in the Institute of uh, Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing. He was, he's been doing research recently uh, where they've seen that only one in five young men who have sex with men under 18 have ever had an HIV test. They've just never had one. And they're the population that is, that's most uh, likely to transmit in this country. He also found, which I found really disturbing, he was telling me he had uh, conducted a focus group with teenage uh, boys who met, had sex with other boys, mm -hmm. and they asked them about their sex lives, and they said they'd never, they weren't ever using condoms. And when Brian asked them why, they said, well, you know, we knew we couldn't get pregnant. So they had been taught that the only mm. use for condoms was pregnancy, and they're not being taught that this is something that protects people from uh, diseases, and, and of course, is very specifically a concern of LGBTQ young people. Stephen Thrasher, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.